Okay, welcome, everybody. welcome everybody to um, to the third lecture of Dan Licata. He's going to show us today uh, how to formalize an act that it by one of S one is Z. Okay, so um, what I'm going to show today builds on what we did in lecture four and in lecture five. So if you're watching this later, I'd uh, recommend that you go look at those. Um, before watching this one. So if you remember from lecture four, we defined the circle in homotopy type theory. And the circle is a type with a point and a loop. And then the universal property that we gave for the circle is that to map out of the circle into any other type X, it suffices to find a point and a loop in that type X. And then that determines a map from S1 to the circle and that map, when you apply it to the base point, gives you x. And when you apply it in the sense of app to the loop, it gives you the loop that you put in. And then in lecture five, we talked about the dependent elimination rule for the circle. So the idea is that the dependent elimination rule for the circle lets you construct a section of a diff type family. So it lets you construct a pi type for every x and x1, big x of x holds. And the way that you do that is you have to give x of base, so you have to prove x for base, and then you have to prove x for the loop in the sense of this weird path over a path type that we started talking about. Um, something got a little screwed up here. Um, this weird uh, path over a path type that we started talking about in lecture five. And so in lecture five, we gave some facts about this path over type, like the fact that it's equivalent to transporting one side, giving a homogeneous path with the other. And if you looked at the exercises um, for lecture five, you've seen a few characterizations of pathovers in particular types. We'll see a few more of those today. But um, using that, we can give a nice statement of the elimination rule for the circle. And when you get to cubicle agda in um, Anders's lectures coming up in lectures, agda lecture 789, then the way that cubicle agda treats the higher inductive limbs will be a lot like this kind of path over type, a little bit different, but um, same spirit to that. So that's why I wanted to state things this way um, for that. Okay, so now we've got this type S1. And you can define lots of other spaces in a similar way. So a lot of spaces in homotopy theory are built out of pushouts, which was another example of a higher inductive type that we talked about very briefly in lecture four. Um, a lot of other things are, for example, you can get the rest of the spheres by suspending, repeatedly suspending the circle using the suspension type that we talked about very briefly in lecture four. So using higher inductive types, you can present a bunch of spaces. And then a fun thing to do in homotopy type theory is to try to prove kind of basic algebraic topology results about these spaces. And one of the basic things that people try to prove is to uh, calculate what's called the homotopy groups of a space. And we don't quite have the technology on the table to talk about the homotopy groups of a space yet because doing so uses something called the truncations which we haven't talked about yet. So if you've seen the truncation levels in the hot track, did that happen already or is that still coming up? Yeah, okay, yeah. So if you saw the truncation levels in the hot track, then the truncation operations are the best way of approximating a type as a type of a particular truncation level. So for example, the set truncation is the best set approximating a type. With that kind of operation, you can really define what an, uh, algebraic topologists would recognize as the homotopy groups. But for today, we're going to focus on what's called the loop spaces of a type. The idea being that the loop space of S1, which I'll write as omega 1 S1, is supposed to be the type of loops in S1. And well, OK, we have to pick a point to have loops at that point. So I'll pick the base point. So the loop space of S1 at the base point, though I'll kind of leave that implicit today, is just the type of paths in S1 from base to base. So that's the first loop space of S1. And then you can iterate this. So for example, uh, the second homotopy group of S1 would be defined in terms of something called the second loop space of S1, which is going to be paths from 
ruffle base to ruffle base as paths from base to base in S1. So you can think of this as uh, going one level up from at the first level I have loops and then at the next level I have paths between paths between the identity on base and the identity on base as paths there. And we won't really use the double loop space, but I just wanted to show two so that you can kind of extrapolate the three is like raffle raffle equals raffle raffle base equals raffle base and so on. You can just kind of iterate it to gesture at the fact that using iterated identity types, here's one identity type, here's an identity type in an identity type, three would be an identity type in an identity type in an identity type, et cetera. We've got the vocabulary to talk about all these iterated loop spaces. And the iterated loop spaces of a type get really complicated in part because of all the infinity groupoid structure that arises from path induction. So for example, um, calculating the homotopy groups of spheres that is something that's a hard problem in algebraic topology. Like we don't sort of have a formula, easy formula for that. Um, so it's kind of an interesting mathematical question. For today, we're just gonna focus on this one, um, which is gonna be the loop space of the circle and ignore all the higher stuff. But for example, for S2, the two sphere, which you can define as the suspension of S1, um, it gets, pretty hard to figure out exactly what the homotopy groups are. And so there's interesting math arising there. And so Dan, a lot of there's people- There's a fairly so, good question. Why okay, do we take um, the second loop space to be uh, ruffle base equals ruffle base instead of loop equals loop? Because um, that's how it's classically defined. I mean, I think, uh, let's see. Will those turn out to be the same in this case? I actually don't know off the top of my head. That's a good question. Um, so like for any pointed type, you can talk about the loop space at that point. So you could point it differently, but kind of the canonical definition of the higher homotopy groups is to take the um, paths on the endpoint to be REFL. And that's because like, no matter what type you're talking about, you know, it has REFL, but for some types, it might not have a loop. Um, yeah, that is a good question. Thank you for breaking in. Other questions? So a lot of people have done a lot of work in HOT on what we call synthetic homotopy theory, which is roughly proving things that somebody in algebraic topology or homotopy theory might recognize as a theorem inside HOT using higher inductive types. So for example, we've calculated a bunch of homotopy groups of spheres and done things like the Freudenthal suspension theorem and the blakers massey theorem and a whole bunch of other work. It used to be that I could sort of list it all off, but now there's been like a decade of work on this and there's a ton of stuff. So uh, you can find um, some of it in the hot book and some of it in Egbert's intro to hot book and other of it in lots of papers that have happened. I just wanna today give you a nice flavor for um, one particular proof. So the idea is that we're gonna calculate the loop space of the circle and calculate in this sense means to prove an equivalence with some other type. <laughs> so it's not uh, like calculate in the sense of like you put it into the proof assistant and it tells you the answer. It's like we're going to explicitly construct an equivalence with some other type. And the idea is that the other type is supposed to count how many paths there are from base to base on the circle. <laughs> and this proof in hot, they're gonna show, um, was first done by Mike Schulman, and then he did it in kind of a slightly more mathematical way, you might say. And then the proof that I'll show today is my simplification of that proof that's a little more type theoretic and eliminates some of the detours. And if you've been following the hot track, there's some spots in what I'll do today that have been um, abstracted into nice lemmas that you can apply like the fundamental theorem of identity types. So you can um, avoid some of the work I'm doing today by deploying a general of this proof, but today I'll just do it kind of straight out in case you haven't been following all of that and just prove the bits of it directly in this case. <coughs> I think it's a little bit instructive to see what it looks like to do this in specific examples a few times before seeing it um, in general. Okay, so now we wanna count how many paths from base to base there are. And so we can start by just kind of 
trying to count it and see what happens. So I've set up some integers on the left here, kind of uh, foreshadowing what the answer is going to be. So if we start to count paths on the circle, well, we've got reflectivity. I'm going to number that zero. We've got the loop. I'm going to number that one. We've got the loop composed with the loop. I'm going to number that two. We've got the inverse of the loop. I'm going to number that uh, negative one. We've got the inverse of the loop composed with the inverse of the loop. I'm going to number that negative two. <coughs> Sorry for the cost today. I got a little sick over the weekend. and just, My voice is a little aggravated by talking. So hopefully that's not picking up too loudly on the microphone. Um, OK, so we can count things like that. And so we can enumerate at least z many paths on the circle. And the idea is that's going to turn out to be the right number. So how could this fail to turn out to be the right number? Well, there might be more than z many distinct paths on the circle, right? So for example, another path that I can write down is loop then loop inverse or something like that. Right, like that's another path on the circle. But it should go in one of the above buckets if we think about these paths up to homotopy. Because up to homotopy are up to paths between paths. What is loop compose loop inverse? Which bucket should that go into? Somebody says raffle, I agree, right? We've proved that loop compose loop inverse has a homotopy to zero. So that goes into that bucket there. And you know, similarly, if you do like loop, loop, loop inverse or something, then that would go into that bucket there because after you collapse inverses, there's one thing left, right? So <laughs> Up to definitional equality, there's more than one path, more than z many paths on the circle, but up to homotopy, up to paths, up to everything you can prove by path induction, we can reduce them like that. Okay, so that's one potential problem. The other potential problem is that maybe there's actually fewer than these. Like maybe it turns out that Refl is the same as loop, right? Those both have the same type. A priori, we don't know that. Raffle is different than loop. You could define a different higher inductive type where you put in as a constructor that Raffle was equal to loop. And in that case, Raffle would be equal to loop. We didn't put that in as the circle when we did the circle, right? The circle was just a type with a base point in a loop, not like some other stuff. And so the hope is that this turns out to not have any spurious identifications like that. <coughs> in, in fact, it won't. So, um, you know, that won't be true. OK, so hopefully that gives you some idea for sort of abstractly, conceptually, kind of where we're going with this is we somehow want to write something in hot that shows that there's exactly z many paths on the circle. Does that make sense? Any questions about um, that part? So to do this, we're going to need a definition of integers. And um, if you want to be concrete about it, you can do something like this. You can say the integers are a type where I have pause, which takes n to z. I have 0, which is in z. And I have neg, which takes uh, n to z. And so the idea is then this gets a little goofy because like positive of the natural number of zero is the representation of one. Negative of the natural number of zero is the representation of negative one. Zero is the representation of zero, right? So like there's off by ones when you're reading <coughs> pause and neg there. And so then the idea is that z is just like the co-product of n plus 
one plus n with the constructors representing positive numbers, zero and negative numbers. And you can do the whole proof with this kind of um, concrete definition of the integers, which is a lot like the definition of the natural numbers that you saw in the previous Agda lectures. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to give basically an interface for this that codifies everything that we need for the proof about the integers. And then I'm going to do the proof of pi 1 of s1 in terms of that interface. And then if we get to it or in the lecture notes, you can see how to implement that interface in terms of the concrete integers there. So there's no, nothing really fancy going on. Like you could have just done it all out explicitly, but it helps to kind of isolate the interesting bit of the proof relative to thinking about higher inductive types from the part of the proof that's sort of more lectures one through three material where you're just kind of messing around with some basic types in Martin left type theory. Okay. So what is the idea for the integers that we're going to use? We're going to think of the integers as <coughs> a type with some constructors and an elimination rule, but I'm going to do it in a slightly funny way. So first of all, I'm going to say that Z is a type and well, Z should have a zero. So I'm going to have a zero. Pretty incontroversial I, uncontroversial, I hope. And then the next thing you might think is that there should be a successor function that takes z to z, right? Because given a number n, I can add one to it. I can add one to zero and get one. I can add one to negative 17 and get negative 16. It doesn't matter where I am. I can add one to it. But I can also always subtract one, right? I can subtract one from zero to get negative one. I can subtract one from positive 17 to get positive 16. It doesn't matter where I am. Um, I can always subtract one. And we can kind of efficiently represent that by saying that successor isn't just a function from z to z, the plus one function. It's a whole package of successor and predecessor packaged together, along with the proof that plus one and minus one are mutually inverse. And if you um, think about things this way, the nice thing is it sort of takes a little bit of the arbitrary division of stuff in the coproducty definition out of the game because you don't explicitly think about, is it positive or zero or negative, right? So if you're implementing a, a successor, then it takes negative of zero to zero and it takes zero to positive zero and so on, right? It switches between constructors. Here, we're just saying it's a type with a successor and predecessor function. <coughs> and then we'll package it all together into the fact that this gives you an equivalent. Okay, so this is just saying Z has a zero and a successor and predecessor. Package together. And then what we're going to do is we're going to give um, Z an induction principle that says that it's the least type with a zero and a successor predecessor like equivalents. So for any other type X, if X has a point Z, um, and a equivalence like that, then we're going to say, and an equivalence like that, then we're going to say that that determines a map from Z here into X. Okay, so what's going on with that? Well, If you think about mapping this type into some other type, you have to send zero and positive and negative in somewhere. 
And where you send those is going to turn out to be determined by where you send n plus 1 for any n. And that's going to be determined by this equivalence here, successor. The successor equivalence is like how to send plus 1 somewhere. And you're going to have to send plus 1 and minus 1 to inverse things. And so this tells you that a map out of z is determined by a point in the type and an equivalence. I know that's a little hand wavy. <laughs> if we have time, we can see how you pr really prove this for this definition. But that's kind of the intuition there. Question yet or uh, not quite yet? So now what we want to say is some reduction rules that says what this does. So what should we get out if we do Z rec on Z and S, I guess I called that B and S, on zero? Well, the idea is that this function is supposed to send B to, um, we'll call it Z little z to uh, zero to little z. So that's what it does. And then um, what happens if we have a successor? Then, <coughs> well, what we're going to ask is, what happens if you do z rec with z and s on the successor of some x where x is in z. Mm. Then what we're supposed to get out is the forward direction of the recursive call like that. OK, so the idea here is that this computation rule says that Z rec on x plus 1 applies the given image of successor to Z rec on x. It'll turn out that from this, you can prove that, for example, Z rec on the predecessor sends that to the other direction of that um, forward here. Sorry, if you don't remember this from last time or the exercises, forward of an equivalence is just the map part of an equivalence. So I abbreviated them um, FWD and BWD sometimes for forward and backward parts of an equivalence. So since successor is an equivalence Z to Z, it has a forward which goes from Z to Z and a backward, which in this case also goes from Z to Z. Cool. OK, good. OK. So those are the computation rules there that say how a map out of uh, Z determined by a point and an equivalence is supposed to behave. Okay, now what I wanna do is to then give one final bit, which is an equivalent, is a uniqueness principle that says, if I want to know that some other function from uh, at z to x is the z rec of z and s on x, then I'm going to ask under what, what do I have to check about that other function f in order to see that this is true? <laughs> and it'll turn out that what I have to check is that for one thing, on zero, it behaves like this does. So what does this do on zero? It gives you back this chosen point Z. And so if F of zero is Z, then um, it goes like that. And then the other thing is that I'll have to check that um, 
I'm going to edit out you know, like this. My F commutes with um, successor, sends successor to S in the same way that ZREC does. And then that'll turn out to say that F is the same as this ZREC. So this uniqueness principle, um, you could give an induction principle for this, like a dependent eliminator from which you could prove this uniqueness principle, but this uniqueness principle will be a little bit closer to what we end up needing below. So um, I'm gonna just state it this way. And it says that um, there's a unique, so this is saying that there's a unique map from Z to X determined by Z and successor, as long as it's sort of a homomorphism an algebra homomorphism, meaning that it sends the structure of zero to Z and it sends the structure of successor to S in this sense. Okay, so that, um, gives you a definition of Z. And then this universal property that here, you can implement it in the um, support code for the lecture in the notes. You can find an implementation of all of this stuff in terms of this type. So if you're curious like what this actually aligns to, you can see it there. We'll go over it if we have time. Okay, good. So now that I've got a definition of Z, what I want to do is to remember construct my equivalence between Z and paths from base to base, right? That was the game. Now we've got a definition of Z. So let's write a function that takes Z to paths from base to base. And so what we do is we use our elimination rule for Z, the Z rec. And what we need to do is we need to give a path from base to base and a equivalence between paths from base to base and paths from base to base. So this path from base to base is supposed to be the image of zero. And if we look up at our intuitive chart, the image of zero was, well, loop composed by loop or something, right? But like the canonical representative of that is reflexivity. So we can call that reflexivity and um, do that. And so now what we need to do is we need to give a um, equivalence between loops on the circle and loops on the circle. And morally, this equivalence is um, what we want to do when we apply the successor function to an integer. What is that? It's what that translates to as an operation on loops on the circle to loops on the circle. So what in our chart does successor on an integer do? Well, if we get the like weird ones out of the way. When I do successor, right? Zero to one, I have one more loop. One to two, I have one more loop. Uh, negative one to zero, I have one more loop and then I collapse the loop inverse, et cetera, right? So every time I do a successor, I'm supposed to have one more loop. <clears throat> okay. So what we're supposed to put here is an equivalence between paths from base to base and paths from base to base, where the successor direction of that, the forward direction of that, adds another loop to the path that I'm given. So we can do that by, um, I like my, it's find it easier to write out the equivalences if you just write the map once rather than twice when you're writing out the um, bi-invertible map. So we'll just kind of spell it out as stuff like that. Okay, so we need a map from base loops on the circle to loops on the circle. Give me a path on the circle. Let's see which side I did this time. Um, I can get another path on the circle circle by post composing with loop, meaning adding one more loop to the path. And then the next thing I need to do is to figure out, okay, why is that map post composition with loop an isomorphism, a bijection, a uh, 
less than totally coherent equivalence. Well, I need a reverse map, and then I need to show that they're um, inverses on either side. So what should I do to undo the successor? Well, the predecessor, when I go up in my chart, right, going from 0 to 1, I have one more bang loop. When I'm going from uh, 0 to negative 1, I have one more loop inverse. When I go from negative 1 to negative 2, I have one more loop inverse. Going from loop to raffle, I have one more loop inverse, and then I cancel, and so on. So my inverse map here is going to be composing with loop inverse there. And so then here, what I need is to show that um, if I have p then loop then loop inverse, then I get back p. And let's see, how do I do that? Um, I can write associate it. <clears throat> And then change the associativity. And after I've changed the associativity, well, on one side I've got P, and on the other side I've got P composed, something that should cancel to reflexivity. So what I want to do is I want to cancel that. How do I cancel that? We talked about this lemma back in lecture. Four, I think it was. So I think it was called inverses cancel on the right with loop is the one there. And then here, what does that one look like? Looks like same kind of thing except the um, loop and the inverse loop. Oops, the inverse loop have switched places. So let's see if we can uh, just do a copy and paste. Um, same kind of thing, except the inverse loop and the loop have switched places. So we'll use inverse on the left there. OK, done. In the exercises, you might be thinking like that seemed a little specific. In the exercises, you can do a general version of this that works for composition with any path. So <coughs> this is kind of inlining something that's true in much more generality. but. We'll only need it for loop and loop inverse here. So I can just kind of inline it there. So the path algebra here is like, you know, a little hard to read if you don't write out the full equational chains, um, like would be nicer. But when you're just doing it in Agda, sometimes I tend to just bang it out and just do like, oh, I need to associate it and then apply an inverse. And I need to, you know, do the steps and just get it to touch check there. OK, so that's how we um, define a map from Z to paths on the circle. And the idea is that this is supposed to send 0 to reflexivity and send successor of n to whatever it sends n to composed with the loop and to send uh, predecessor of n to whatever it sends n to composed with loop inverse. And so that's kind of the idea for mapping our integers here into paths on the circle. OK, any questions about that bit? Cool. Okay, now we get to the fun part. So the next thing that you might try is to write down a converse to this, right? Because, well, I'm trying to construct a bijection and isomorphism and equivalence between integers and paths from base to base. <coughs> I've got a map in one direction. I need a map in the other direction and to prove that the two composites are the identity. The problem is we don't really have any leverage on paths from base to base because we can't do path induction on a path from base to base because it's got both of its endpoints fixed. So we can't like try to do path induction or something like that. So here, 
it's not really clear what to do. The thing that we can try to do is to kind of free this up and say, Something that I could do path induction on is a path from base to x for any x on the circle, right? Because if I've got something of this shape, then I can pattern match on it like that, right? Singleton contractibility pattern matching on paths, base path induction lets me contract that one. So that motivates trying to free up this and say, okay, maybe I you know, put Z there or something like that, that won't turn out to work. But what I want is something here where when I put in base, I get what I started and where I can construct this map in full generality. And the motivation for that, from my point of view, is really just the fact that we need to generalize this so that we can do path induction, because I don't have like a direct way to case on a path and ask, is it loop, or is it loop compose loop, or is it loop compose loop inverse, or is it loop inverse compose loop inverse, and so on. Paths are kind of taken to be abstract. They're generated by all these groupoid operations because of that, that are given by path induction. Because of that, we don't like directly just enumerate cases and let you sort of write the reverse of this in a nice way or something like that. So this thing here is something that we're going to call the cover of the circle. And um, in mathematical terms, it's what's called the universal cover of the circle which is um, a type family over the circle. So what it is is a type family over the circle, meaning that it's a function from the circle into the first universe. And so we're going to put something here such that we can free up this endpoint of the path and then do path induction to define our converse map there. And then our converse map that we were originally interested in will just be, oh, uh, hopefully encoding at base there. Like the idea is that if we plug in the base point, that's supposed to be a function from paths from base to base to the integers. So what that says is that we need the cover over the base to be the integers, which we can do um, when we define the cover. OK, so how do we define a map from the circle into the universe? Well, how do we define a map from the circle into anything? It's by S1 rec. If we define a map from the circle into the universe, what we need here is um, an element of the universe, a type. And to make encode base be base to base to z, what we need is that when x here is base, cover of base is z. OK. And so then that much will be um, determined there. And so then, let's see. Uh, What we need to do to finish our encode here is um, to give a number. And so, um, well, what number should we give? This is supposed to be the image of the base point and the image of um, and the path being reflexivity. And when the path is reflexivity, the number that we're supposed to give is zero. I'm going to rewrite this bit in a second um, to make it work with some other lemmas that we'll do. But intuitively, we do path induction on this. That lets us just say what we're supposed to send reflexivity to. <coughs> and so what we send reflexivity to is zero. Uh, 
Okay, so this is looking pretty good, except what we have left to fill in is this bit, which is a path from Z to Z in the universe. And we don't really have a good handle on how to construct paths in the universe yet, but um, we can add one. And the way that we'll add one is, we haven't seen this in the Agda track too much yet, um, is to postulate a bit of the univalence axiom, which is to say that given an equivalence between types in X and Y, what we'll get is a path from X to Y. So one of the ways that you can motivate why univalence is necessary is um, from a very like hacky point of view, you can say that, okay, if I've already got S1 rec around and I want to do this proof that the fundamental group of the circle is C, then I get to this point and I say, hey, what I need is a um, path from Z to Z. I don't have a good way to make that. But um, if I do the univalence axiom, then suddenly I don't need a path from Z to Z. Um, instead, what I need is an equivalence between Z and Z. And what's the other constructor that we assumed about Z? It's that Z has an endoequivalence given by successor and predecessor. OK, so that's what's happening there. Any questions about that? So this bit UA is just the first part of the univalence axiom. We'll need another bit in a second, but I'll let us um, kind of invent the spot where we need the other bit before we state the other bit. Like in the notes, it tells you what the full univalence axiom is. If we don't get to it, you can look at it there. But um, <coughs> for now, we'll just need this bit. I'm kind of like just trying to invent all of this uh, on the go there. OK, so now for this one, I want to define it in a slightly different, but um, homotopic way, which is to say that if you remember the transport thing that we talked about in earlier um, lectures, then transport cover of P will be a function from cover of base to cover of X, right? When P is a path like that. And so we can then start with zero and transport it. And if you unfold the definition of transport, this will be exactly the same thing, right? Because transport does path induction on P. And then <laughs> in that case, we'll return the zero. So this is just another way of writing the same thing. But making it definitionally equal to a transport will help me out in a little bit later. OK, so now what we've got is our converse map from paths from base to base to Z. And so, OK, we've got two maps, right? We've got our one constructed like this, and we've got our one constructed like that. And now all that's left is to show that these two maps compose to the identity in both directions. Make sense? We know what an equivalence is. You can get an equivalence out of two maps that are homotopic to the identity in both directions. <coughs> and um, so, well, OK, that's what we got to do. All right, so generally speaking, the one on Z or the equivalent of Z, um, which is down here, is going to be the easier one. Because when you're characterizing these path types or loop spaces, <coughs> in one direction, you're sort of working with data like the integers or something like that. Um, and in the other direction, you're kind of working with abstract stuff like paths. And when you're working from the concrete data, like the integers, you can kind of just do the things you usually do for concrete data. So um, I'm going to do this one in a couple of steps. So first of all, I'm going to try to fill in a lemma. So if you look at loop to the and then encode base, I guess here we called encode base encode first try. So we can just call it that. 
Um, if you look at these two functions that we're trying to show their composite is the identity, then um, let's see. What we've got when we compose these two is an endo function on Z. And so what we can do is we can make up a lemma that says, when is an endo function on Z the identity, homotopic to the identity? And this will just be like a slight helper on top of the uniqueness principle. One thing you'll want is that f of 0 is 0. And another thing you'll want is that for every x, Um, you have that f of successor of x is what? Successor of f of x. So if f takes um, 0 to 0 and successor to successor, then f will be homotopic to the identity. OK. And so how do you prove this? Well, let's see. We get an f and an f0 and an f successor uh, and an x there, and then we need to show this stuff. And um, the first thing we can do is to apply the uniqueness principle with this f0 and f successor are sort of directly set up to match the form of this z rec unique that I stated up here. They're the particular case of that for f. And so if you apply this um, like that, then Let's see where that lands us. Oops. That lands us with needing to show that zrec with zero and successor of x is equal to x. So that's kind of an eta expansion of um, x. And we can apply that, the uniqueness principle again with zero and successor. In the opposite direction to get that unique. And then what we're left to show is that zero is zero and uh, successor is successor there. Okay. Anyways, details aren't super important, but the main reason I wanted to do that is just that like this is the spot where Z rec unique shows up is in this lemma here, which says when a map from Z to Z is the identity. Okay, so given that we have that, well, now we're trying to show, let's see, with an X, I guess even without an X, that, um, Encode first try compose loop to the oh wait loop to the is just a regular caret um, there. Okay, so this basically lets us do cases and say, okay, I've got to prove something for zero and I've got to prove something for successor. And the something for zero looks like this. It says the encoding of loop to the zero gives us back zero. Well, why is that? What does ZRAC do on zero, right? That's a reducible thing. So we can do ZRAC zero here, which says that uh, with two things, we can reduce that. And usually Agda can guess kind of what the two things are. So I'll just try that um, and let it guess. And so we do that um, reduction there. And then after we do that reduction, then we get encoding of REFL base. Well, encoding is transport. Transport on REFL is definitionally whatever you put in. So we should get back zero there. 
And so we're good there. Okay, so that's how you do that one. And then um, what we've got left is for every X and Z, encoding of loop to the successor of something is successor of encoding loop to the something of X. Okay, so this one gets a little bit scarier. So what we need to do is to um, first, I'll just copy this one in because it's not too interesting. Um, we need, okay. If you look in here, we've got loop to the successor of X, loop to the was defined by a Z rack. Um, Z rack reduces on successor to deploy the thing you put in. And so we can first reduce that bit and see what happens after we reduce the thing you put in. And so then what we get is, okay, not super readable, but um, something where we've got the encoding of this stuff with X is the same as successor of stuff of encode uh, loop to the X. Okay, so now we've got those two left to reconcile. And so um, the encoding here is going to give us some uh, transporty stuff that we're gonna need to deal with. So, um, let's see, we're gonna get the successor on the outside and we've got this encoding, right? Yeah, okay. So if we write it out, in a slightly more readable way, what we've got is um, that if we transport in the cover of um, uh, so loop to the X, then loop starting with zero. is successor of that stuff. Okay, let's see if I got this right. Okay. <clears throat> so intuitively, what we're trying to show is that if we do and remember um, this bit is loop to the x and this bit encode first try is transport in the cover loop to the x starting with zero. Okay, let me beta reduce that a little more. Good. Okay, so if you just let Agda do all that reduction then you can get it into a slightly more readable form where what you've got going on is that you need to show that transporting in the cover on loop to the X with another loop stuck on the end is the same as transporting along loop to the X and then sticking a successor on the outside. And why should that be true? Like, where is this successor coming from? <coughs> well, loop inside, turning into successor outside is somehow supposed to be coming from the fact that 
successor is what we put in as the image of the loop in this S1 rec. So somehow this should sort of be a beta reduction where um, you somehow beta reduce something about this definition to get that this part of it will fall out. Okay. So, um, cool. Okay, so that's what we got to do. So, what we need to figure out is something about reducing transport cover on the loop. So, we can kind of do this up here. So, if I ask the question now, What happens if I, so we can, before we get to the full version that we're using below, let's just um, do a simple version where we say, suppose I transport in the cover, then on the loop, then um, what do I get? And so if you kind of look at this in its normal form, what you get is that transporting in the cover <coughs> on the loop will go transport in a type that's defined by S1 rec. And so we kind of want to pull that successor out of that S1 rec somehow. And we don't quite have um, a way to do that because if you recall, what we have is a reduction rule for app of S1 rec on the loop. So the first thing we need is a lemma that Let's us <coughs> rewrite a transport as an app. So we can kind of expose an app to reduce um, there. And so the general deal here is that if you have a transport along a path in something, you can instead stick the type family C onto the path that'll give you a path in the universe. And then you can transport along the identity function there to do that. And when you get to cubicle type theory, this bit, the transport along the identity function will be called coe for coercion, but uh, I'll just write it as transport on the identity there. And that exposes an app here where when we apply this in this particular case, what we need to do is to, um, apply that lemma, then what happens is that we've got a transport in app of S1 rec on loop. And that part's good news because if we um, then try to um, do something with that, app of the cover on loop is exactly f of an S1 rec on a loop, which we know we have a uh, reduction rule for, right? S1 rec loop will do, um, when we get to inputs, we'll reduce that. And so that lets us um, get down to the situation where we've got transport in lambda xx on univalence applied to successor there. And so now we've discovered the other little bit of univalence that we'll need, which is a beta reduction rule that in general says that a beta reduction rule that says that when I transport in the identity here along univalence, well, that's taking an X and giving a Y. How else can you take an X and give a Y the forward direction of this equivalence? So 
transporting forwards along a path determined by univalence from X to Y, the data that we put in that's supposed to justify that is exactly the forward direction of the equivalence E. And UA beta says that, well, when you do that, what you get out is exactly the uh, forward direction E there. OK, so our UA beta should uh, close this um, there. OK, and so then we've uh, shown that you can transport along the cover and loop. And so it turns out that these two are, in fact, equivalent. These, in fact, imply the full univalence axiom. The full univalence axiom is in the notes, and I think it'll come up later in the hot track. But um, for now, it's enough to just do these. That's the only bits we'll need here. In fact, this is, suspicious, is sufficient basically because of the fundamental theorem of identity types that you did in the hot track and the fact that um, being an equivalence is a proposition. But we're done with univalence for today. So that's, you know, just for today, that's enough. But it turns out to be sufficient anyways. Or you could just postulate the whole thing. OK. So the way to think about univalence is it's a way to turn equivalences into paths where when you transport along those paths, you get out what you put in. That lets us reduce transporting in the cover. And then we're almost done. We're almost ready to finish the uh, goal there. Um, but I need one more little um, path algebra thing, which is that um, the, OK, so this tells us what happens when you transport in the cover around just a loop it does successor. The situation we're in down below is to see what happens when you transport along something and then a loop, and it needs to do successor, and then the transport in the cover on something. Right. So there's a little bit of extra junk going on because we're not just transporting along a loop, we're transporting along P composed loop for some P there. And so if you transport along p compose loop for some p there, then you'll get out successor. But what's left is transporting in the cover along the remaining p here, right? So thinking about it as um, transporting along a path that's like loop compose some other stuff. What you do is you first get a successor for the loop, and then you transport along the other stuff there. And that's just like a path induction, and then some of the path lemmas, like the unit law and stuff. So this is path induction, unit law that we talked about in lecture four. And then the key point is this one. And the key point of this one is that it does UA beta. OK, so you can look at a generalization of this if you want in the exercises. So generally, you can transport in something along P then Q and figure out what that is. But um, here, I've just kind of specialized it to this one that I'll need here and do that. OK. And so now basically this transport cover then loop is going to be what we need to close this one. Uh, because hopefully if I plug in loop to the X there, then I'll get um, and zero Z there, then I'll get what I wanted there. And now that we've got this, right? Like I could have just, uh, plug that in there in the first place. Like, there's no reason to pull it out as a separate thing and give it a name. But it's kind of nice because um, it's a little bit complicated. And I wanted to emphasize what we're trying to do before we actually did it. OK, so we are three quarters of the way done, right? We've got a function from uh, numbers to loops. We've got a function from loops to numbers. We've checked that one composite is the identity. In particular, the composite where we start with a number, iterate loop, 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 or loop inverse, loop inverse, loop inverse, right? Because that's what um, this function is spitting out. And then do the transport stuff to come back comes back as the identity. OK? So what do we have left? We've got the other composite, which looks like this, right? 
what we've got left is to say for any loop on the circle, if I encode that and then do loop to the <coughs> that number, then I get back where I started. <coughs> okay. And so um, now we've got to do that. Good. Big picture makes sense. We've got two functions. We've checked one composite. All that's left is to check the other composite. But once again, we're kind of stuck because this is a path. It's a path from base to base. I have basically no leverage on paths from base to base. And so like there's no like eliminator or induction principle or something that I can do to apply this. So what I'm going to do is the same trick that I did up here when I was defining encode, which is to somehow generalize the problem so that it can be about a path from base to x that we can do path induction on or transport on, however you want to phrase it, um, instead of a path from base to base. So the generalized version down here. It's just a, check is going to be um, something of this shape where I've got a circle and then I've got a path from base to X. And then what I need to do is I need to decode encode there or something like that. Okay, so the point is that I would like it to be the case that this generalized version that we'll go over in a second on base is going to be my way to solve that. Okay, so my goal here is that the generalized version here, which abstracts over a point in S1, so that we can free things up, so that we can do path induction. Okay, um, will somehow give us what we want. Right, so the generalized version here is that. The problem is we can't state the generalized version with just the loop to the here because this thing here, when we encode, if we have a general path here from base to X for a free endpoint X, not just the base point, what that does is it gives us an element of the cover of X. Loop to the takes Z to paths, but the cover of X isn't Z, the cover of base is Z. When X is the base point, the fiber over the base point is known to be Z. The cover of X in general is kind of just something. So what we need to do to generalize this composite is we need to generalize the back map from Z to base equals base to something that looks like the converse to the whole encode thing here, where encode was base is X to cover of X. What we need here is cover of X to base is X in general there. So if we free up that endpoint by defining this decode, then it will, um, okay, let me try to put Agda back into a consistent state. Um, let us do that there. Okay, so really all of the work is gonna be in generalizing our loop to the end map so that it's something of type for any X in the circle, cover of X zero basis X. And then the rest of it will be um, kind of easy given that. So hopefully that motivates how we get to trying to define something of this type. How do we define something of this type? Well, this is a map out of the circle. How do we map out of the circle? 
right? We're defining a map out of the circle where it's not just S1 arrow something, it's a whole dependent type. And so um, for that whole dependent type, we've got to do not just S1 recursion like in lecture four, but S1 elimination like in lecture five, so that we do that. Okay, so that gives us a couple of things to do. What do we have to do? Let's ask Agda. We need cover of base arrow loops on the circle. What is cover of base arrow loops on the circle? If we reduce that, that's Z arrow loops on the circle. Hey, we've got that function already, right? So the whole point was that on the base point, we want this to be the loop to the function so that this yellow goes away. And Agda believes that on the base point, when X is base, this theorem will in fact also do that. And so then we'll put it all together there. Okay, so we've worked ourselves down to um, this bit and then that bit. And then we can probably fill this one in now because now what we've got is Z rec on zero. You kind of have to uh, get used to ignoring a bunch of stuff when you eyeball it, but like Z rec and then some stuff on zero. I read that and I think, oh, okay. Um, Z rec zero Z with whatever. And then it turns out to be the right thing. Okay. So why is that? Well, when we defined um, our loop to the, we said that the image of zero was reflexivity. And what we needed in this case was to show that after we've contracted P to reflexivity, then we get back reflexivity. And so that reduction works there, right? So like if we had put in, uh, I don't know, loop or something there, then, okay, well, other stuff wouldn't have touched it first, but that part that I just did also wouldn't have touched it. Okay, so now we're pretty good. And if you um, followed the hot track lecture on um, the fundamental theorem of identity types, then this part, the encode, then decode composite is the one where if you deploy the nice general hammer of the fundamental theorem of identity types, then you can avoid proving this directly because the fundamental theorem of identity types will basically let you do this bit sort of once and for all for any identity type rather than doing it specifically for this one. So you can lemmaify this stuff, but it's not so bad to just do it because in this case, we set things up so that the definitions just kind of let you reduce. Okay, so we're almost done. All we've got is to do this bit. And so now we get another one of these mysterious path over things that we've got to do something with. Okay, so what do we want to do with this um, path over thing? Well, the way that I do these is that I noticed that it's a path over in, say, a function type, right? The outer connective here is a function type. And then I go and either use or invent a lemma about path overs and function types, and then deploy it and kind of reduce the path over based on the type family in which you're doing the path over. So what we need is a lemma of this shape, where if I want to know that for an F, okay, fix an X, A and B both depend on X. I've got a path in the base from X to X prime. F1 lives over X, so it's A of X to B of X. F2 lives over X prime, so it's a X prime to B of X prime. That's just sort of inferred from like, I kind of back infer these from, okay. If I'm gonna state something of this shape that shows up in my goal down below, then like, okay, what types are all of the ingredients supposed to have? Then, um, what I need to do then is to like invent something simpler that I can reduce this to. And how exactly you invent these is a little bit, I mean, there's some general rules that you can then compose together to get them, but like, it's a little bit like, in fact, exactly like asking the question of like, 
I've got some action on objects and I want it to be a functor. Like, why is it a functor? Like, you just kind of have to know what definition is picked or something like that. So this is sort of part of the structure of types that you have to know um, what's supposed to happen here. And so what's supposed to happen in this particular case, I'll do it in the form that's um, easiest for us to use for this particular proof, as there's a few equivalent forms, is that this path over in a function type, I'm going to try to reduce it to a uh, path over in B with a free variable of type A. OK, and so what's going on here is sort of a path over version of function extensionality, where regular functionality, like we talked about in lecture five, says that paths in function types are homotopies. Path over um, function extensionality is going to say that path overs in function types are also fix an A in, let's say, the left-hand side apply the left-hand function to that and show that that has a path in B over P to something. And I can't quite apply F2 to A because, well, A is in X and I need something in X prime, but I can transport in A along P with that to get something in A prime. OK, so I'm really kind of doing two steps at once. There's a more general version of path over um, in function types that would say it's in A and A of X and A prime and A of X prime with a path over between them to this for um, the A and the A prime. And then you can do kind of singleton contractibility roughly or filling or something like that to say that I can contract that A prime to the transport. But this version is true and is the best version for us to use right here. So I'm just gonna state it that way. Um, I won't prove this for you. It looks like I don't have time for that. But if you wanna prove this, the proof is in the notes. But basically what you do is, we talked in lecture five about how you can show that pathovers are the same as transports. And you can shove this pathover into a homogeneous path with a transport, use a rule for what transport in function types does, and then um, use function extensionality for regular paths like we talked about in lecture five, and then kind of turn this into a regular path too to get there. So you can derive all of this from the stuff we've already talked about that's in the notes for the lecture if you wanna read it. So it's not really an additional axiom, but it's kind of almost an additional axiom in the sense that like, instead of postulating regular function extensionality, when you get to cubicle type theory, there'll be something that's a little bit more like this, in fact, that turns into your function extensionality principle that's primitive. So I almost think of this as sort of like what the definition should be. OK, so with that in mind, we can reduce this um, path over in a function type to something like that. And then what we're left with is a path over where the outer connective is now um, base is something, right? That vibration. And so now we have to invent something for that one. And if you'd got through all the exercises, you kind of invented a better version of this one. And in the last lecture and stuff, we saw other kind of variations on it, right? So like in these path vibrations, the question is, what is a path over in the path vibration? And the idea is that it's sort of some kind of composite of paths that gives you something that looks kind of like a square. Though in this case, we don't have to do too much because um, the thing we're looking for is a path between Q and R up to P in this vibration. But here, X is only free on the right here in like the exercises for lecture five, X was on occurring on both sides with a G and you had an F and G and you had to do some app stuff and stuff like that. Here, all you've got is one side and there's no function there. So it's really easy. You just ask that 
Q then P, I think that's the direction that type checks is R. Okay, so in general, a path over and a path vibration in a path type involves some apps and some composites on both sides and stuff, but we can special case that. And this one, I think we can just prove by saying, uh, let's say P is raffle. And then what do we got? Um, let's say H is raffle. And then hopefully um, that's also a raffle because there's nothing else to do. So when they're just about identity types, you can usually just um, kind of smash them with path induction. But for this one, the arrow one, we can't just do path induction to prove it because it involves a function extensionality in there. And so you need to do the function extensionality step there. Okay, so now that we've characterized that path over type, we're down to kind of the meat of this, which is to show that, um, loop to the Z compose loop is the same as loop to the transport in the cover around loop of uh, Z. Okay, so this is another one where we're sort of down to something where we can just do some reduction. And so what we've got is to, um, what do we spy that's reducible there? Um, Let's uh, maybe flip this around. Okay. What do we spy that's reducible there? So here we've got transport in the cover loop Z. Okay, we proved something about that, right? Transport in the cover on loop is supposed to be successor. So transport in the cover of loop on Z is supposed to do something. Okay, and then if we ask Agda, you know, in a file for human readability, I would probably put in the equational reasoning and show this stuff, but just doing it live, I like to just do it and let Agda tell me the next thing that we're supposed to prove. What we need to know is that loop to the successor of Z is loop to the Z composed loop, okay? And again, that's another thing where it's just sort of a reduction because loop to the was defined by ZREC and ZREC reduces on successor to the uh, forward direction of the equivalence you put in. So if we do our ZREC, uh, what was it called? ZREC so successor of Z, I don't know, Agda, please uh, fill in the stuff for us. Then it tells you, you know, a bunch of stuff with some meta variables. But if we then refine, then it's actually doing the right thing, which is to say that it takes successor to the forward direction of the equivalence. The forward direction of the equivalence, right? What we wanted it to take successor to was, okay, uh, loop to the successor of Z is loop to the Z compose loop, well, when we defined loop to the way up here, then we defined it to be take the thing you're given and compose it with loop. So then when we do the um, C on successor reduction, what we get is compose loop there. And so Bagda is happy with that. And voila, we are done. We've proved that the uh, loop space of base to base is equivalent to Z and checked it in Agda. So one of the things that's, that's pretty cool about this is that these proofs in synthetic homotopy theory can be very close to the bare metal of type theory in the sense that you don't need a whole lot of lemmas or a whole lot of libraries or stuff like that. You can just start out with your higher inductive types toss in univalence um, here, Voivodsky's univalence axiom and the beta reduction. And then the rest of it's just kind of coming from path induction and maybe there's some path over stuff, but like everything in this proof is in 
one of the files that we wrote essentially live during the last uh, four and a half hours of class. So like there's not too much background before you get to proving interesting things. And so the way that I kind of came to working on hot stuff was to um, be excited about looking at these proofs from kind of a type theorist point of view where you just say, okay, I don't really need to know any of the math. I don't really know any of the math. Just like, let me mess around with higher inductive types and path induction and see like that and see what you can do. And a lot of it sort of can fall out nicely if you just follow your nose on using um, elimination rules like S1 elim, like we talked about using recursion, using path induction, you can just um, kind of work your way through things there. Okay, so that's kind of one way to approach these. So in the um, next series of lectures on um, cubicle agda, you might get to see some more synthetic homotopy theory. And a lot of this stuff that I've done kind of concretely um, will get a little bit easier there because a lot of this path over stuff that you have to kind of invent will fall out in a little bit nicer way when you get to cubicle agda. And a lot of these definitions of higher inductive types will um, like this are built into cubicle agda. So you don't have to toss in all the postulates and rewrites and the elimination rule and the recursion principle will line up more nicely and so on. Okay, so in the exercises, like I know there was kind of a lot going on today. So the exercises are basically one meta one and one kind of more applied one. So the meta one is to um, show that for a hit, the elimination rule implies the recursion rule, right? So like I've always postulated the recursion rule just because I wanted to talk about it first, but you can get this stuff from this stuff. So you can do that if you want. If you're not so interested in the meta stuff, you're more interested in the applied stuff. The other one is to calculate that the fundamental group of the bow tie, the bow tie is supposed to be like two circles. So like picture a point and two loops looking like a bow tie um, is the free group on two generators. And it's really just kind of a copy paste rearrangement of stuff that's on the screen here. So there's not a lot of um, new stuff going on in that. But I think this proof is heavy enough and slightly weird enough, even though it's kind of short, that it's worth really going through the details yourself and kind of working through one of these because this template of like the encode and the decode and you know showing the composites are the identity, maybe deploying the fundamental theorem of identity types is something that um, shows up a lot for calculating the path spaces or truncations of the path spaces for all kinds of types. So it's a good tool to have in your pocket and so the exercise is really just like, do this again for a slightly more complex type, which means read and actually understand all this stuff. Okay, and the TAs will go over some of that at the problem session. And um, if I can get, let me try to switch my screen sharing just for one second. So I probably shouldn't, uh, just wanna do one more thing. Uh -huh. So um, if you're a mathematician, you've been wondering what the heck I'm talking about all day today, so I should probably show a picture of a helix today. So um, <coughs> this type that uh, we defined here, down here, we have S1. Here, up here, in type theory, this would be the sigma in x of s1 dot the cover over x. Um, often you can picture that type as a helix. And so what is the thing that I did today have to do with a helix? Well, what we defined in type theory was a type where it's a fibration or dependent type over s1. And the fiber over the base point is z which I'm kind of drawing as the points here above this. And then the picture is that as you go around the loop in the base, you're going up one level to the next point above N on the circle there. 
<laughs> and so if you take the total space of this, that is the um, sigma type over S1 of the cover, then you get this picture where you've got something like that. So the geometry isn't really there in um, when you do this in hot, but the idea is kind of the same as this mathematical tool, the universal cover of the circle is the helix, which comes up in a mathy proof of pi one of S1, because you've got the same fibers and you've got the same action there. So one thing that um, you can do is you can do a very different proof of this where you work with um, the sigma, the total space of the cover more than I did here. And so there's lots of different ways of doing these proofs where you're characterizing the path spaces of types. Some of which, I mean, they're all equivalent, but like some of them sort of have a more mathy feel, some of them have a more type theory feel. I tend to do the more type theory ones. Other people like the more mathy ones, but there's a range of things that you can do. I just wanted to show a picture here in case you're coming from the more mathy side to say that like there is a way to kind of reconcile this with what you probably expected me to say much earlier on. And if you're coming from that side, you can kind of do the proofs about total spaces and um, stuff like that. If you're coming from the type theory side, you can do proofs that sort of just break it down into the fibers directly. And it's kind of fun to get people to do proofs in their own ways and then try to talk to them, each other about them and see what we can learn from each other. So thank you for following along with all these lectures and um, I hope to see you in the Discord and in other hot events in the future. I'm glad that everyone is um, getting involved in this research area. Thanks. Well, then thank you so much for these beautiful lectures. Um, I see there's a, a lot of thank yous in, in the chat. People are thanking you. Um, is there any question? If you have a question, you can raise your hand and then you can ask it to Dan directly. Mm -hmm. And we can also do questions after we stop the recording if anyone uh, would like to have a... Okay, yeah. I, I mean, if anyone has questions for the recording, I'm happy to do that too. But, uh... Mike's original proof was the descent one or the flattening lemma one, right? Well, it wasn't called that since Guillaume didn't come up with the flattening lemma until after it, but it was, I think, roughly that. Yeah. I mean, it's in, if you go back to the hot, hot blog, it's still there, like if you want to read it. But yeah, it does like contractibility of the total space. It's that one. So yeah, it's a little bit uh, less direct because like you end up using like a bunch of stuff that you've already talked about in the hot track, but like, you know, maps on fibers being the same as maps between total spaces that can meet with projection and stuff like that. And so um, after reading that, I uh, looked at it and was like, wait a second, this has like detours that you shouldn't really need and like produced this one basically by saying like, we shouldn't really need to involve sigma types if we don't really have them in the theorem statement. And so that was this version of it that came out. Um, yeah, what I did today is a little less than that one though, because um, what I did today only shows that um, base equals base is the same as Z. And so you can strengthen that to showing that base equals X is the same as cover of X in general. That version's in the notes, but I cut it out for time today. And who came up with encode decode proofs in general? Me here. I mean, like that was the origin of it. I mean, it's, you know, mm -hmm. like, or, but like, I mean, really, it's like I should credit like um, Connor McBride and other people who worked on characterizing types in type theory that weren't hot, right? So, like, if you compare this against the characterizations of path types in coproducts or natural numbers and things like that that you've seen, it's really just the same trick. So, like, it's the same, you know, define a type family that's supposed to represent the identity type and then. Um, define maps back and forth and stuff. But this was really just an adaptation of that stuff to hot. Cool. So we heard the argument from the source for yes. everyone. Mm -hmm. OK, I think this is a good moment to stop the recording.